guess I will go ahead and um, get started. So basically the idea for this topic came up uh, last spring. We were doing a book study on Parenting Forward by Cindy Wayne Brandt, this book, um, which introduced a lot of topics, but because it introduced so many topics, it was really kind of surface level stuff um, that we couldn't really delve very deeply into. Um, and one of those topics was parenting for inclusion, teaching our children, well, not only teaching our children to be inclusive towards their peers, um, but to make sure that they know that they are accepted just the way they are uh, and that God loves them uh, the way that he created them to be. Um, but we felt like it, it really didn't go deeply enough. So we wanted to hear from our own uh, Idlewild family to um, give us more insight on how we can raise our our children to uh, be more loving and accepting and feel accepted um, no matter what. So I guess um, the way we can start this is um, just asking questions and then whoever feels like they can answer, they can give us some insight if that works. Um, okay, so the first question would be, uh, what are some ways that we can let our own children and even our uh, child relatives, like nieces and nephews, know that they are safe to be their true selves with us. Like what, what are some of the things we can say to them to just let them know that they will be loved no matter what? I'll, I'll go first and just say real quick. Uh, one thing I suggest, I'm not, and I'm not saying anyone is doing this or would do this, but there are a lot of things you, you, you shouldn't say, like off the cuff, like, I mean, I won't go, there's a laundry list of words like fag or queer or, and we can go on and on, um, or even that's so gay. Um, really not use that in front of your children. Even, even if it's in jest, like, oh my God, that's so gay because they might hear that in a negative connotation at school or somewhere else. So I would, I would avoid any sort of uh, negative words. Again, even if it's in jest or, or it just might get taken the wrong way by a small child. Yeah, I know that was really common to hear when I was in school and I mean, I was guilty of it as well because I come from a very conservative background that is not, it was not accepting of anyone who was gay. And so, I mean, that's what I grew up around. That's what all my friends, they said that stuff all the time. And it just, it never crossed my mind back then. And so I'm very careful now never to to say things like that but coming from back that background having a family from that background um i do have you know nieces and nephews that are being raised in that environment and like my question would be how do i let them know that they would be safe to you know, come out to me if, if they need a safe adult, like, how do I, how do I let them know? 
I, I think just be honest with them. And, and it's in the subtleties. Uh, for example, up in the youth wing, we've included pride flags. And that's, we don't, we're not even saying anything. It's just letting um, the youngsters know that, hey, we're okay. We're okay with it. You see all these signs all over town, like safe space. Um, th those are subtle subtleties as well. Just, uh, and being honest, going back to the first statement is be honest with uh, your kids and with your relatives. Uh, picking backing on what Mark said, I've tried to make myself um, be aware of with nieces and nephews, not, oh, do you have a boyfriend or do you have a girlfriend? But, you know, not assuming that they're going to have a love interest of another gender. Um, and it is just such an ingrained habit, you know, but just, is there someone special or, you know, just um, that sends, I think, a little bit of a signal to a kid who's tuned in. I definitely remember paying attention to the way things were stated when I was growing up. The term partner, the term, um, or when somebody would speak honestly about Chad and AJ in their relationship or Mark and Ben, you know, those things I really remember tuning into and identifying that person as a safe person. Um, because we were, I was overwhelmed with the negative responses when there was a, several older gentlemen in town, well, they're not married and you know, we don't talk about them. Those things stick with a kid. And so when a parent would say, well, they just love a different way or they are gay. Be honest, I think is the best way. And to stop any negative talk that you hear around family, well, that's not okay with me. Um, that helped me identify safe people to talk to growing up. We talk about being um, different taboos, um, you know, being gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, qu queer. By being queer, that's still sort of taboo, less taboo than it used to be. Um, but by not making it such a taboo subject, by being very open and honest about it. Um, taboo is the word I was looking for earlier. I couldn't think of it. Um, but don't make it taboo. Just make it, hey, that's, you know, AJ and Chad or, you know, Laura and Gina or whoever, whoever. You know, just be honest. So I, I know that, like, I am a straight cis woman, but I do have a kind of a opinion about what um, Chad was saying. So growing up, and some of you have heard me say this about my mom, my mom used to drive me nuts because starting from the time I was like 12, I would come home and be like, I have a crush on someone. And every single time it was, tell me about him or her. And I was like, well, it's a him. And, and at the first time it just kind of like, what? And, but well, it was fine. It was a him. And the next time it was like, oh, I have a day. Tell me about him or her. And it was like, mom, it has always been a him. Like it will always be a him. Until I met Nate, it was, tell me about him or her. And it's like the whole time I was like dating or interested or anything. It was, it was always that. And at the time it was very frustrating. Um, but in retrospect, like it was so much better for me to be frustrated or annoyed or even kind of offended than if I had been gay and not felt comfortable. Like I would rather run the risk of like making a straight child feel awkward than making a gay child feel unloved. So just that, that's my perspective of like, my mom made me feel super awkward about it when I was a kid and I wouldn't trade that for anything. So like, just in case there's some like worry about like, well, I don't want to like make them feel weird. Like it's okay to feel weird. I felt weird and it's fine. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> I have a question. So we have a niece who we believe she's, you know, she's 14 and we think she may be 
transgender curious. We don't know what the situation is because her parents aren't, aren't bringing it up around family. Cause honestly, I think it would be too hard for our parents or grandparents to cope with. So I think they're kind of keeping that away. How would, how do we express to our niece and her parents that this is, you know, we can talk about it. We, we don't want to, yeah, we want to be safe. We also understand they want to have boundaries and not uh, have her grandparents be upset with her. We just don't know how to approach the whole family. I'm kind of in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take just real quick. One way would be to, I mean, just to acknowledge something would be next time you're around them, if you, if it works into the conversation or if you can work it in, say, yeah, we were, um, we were down at the Gay Pride Parade and um, had a good time last week or Idlewild always, we always help out with the Idlewild 10 or we helped out this year. We went, to, uh, or, um, you know, I, I was, we were at Cooper Young having dinner. We, we stopped by the, um, the community center and poked our heads in just to see what was going on. So I think, I, I think my sister, well, it's my sister and her husband. I, they're fully aware that we're comfortable with gay LGBT community. I mean, we, Whitney's sister and her wife are, you know, part of our family and we're fully welcoming them. I think my sister and her husband are reserved to bring it around my family to just to they don't want to, I don't know if embarrass or bring it up with my parents. They haven't let on to us. The family hasn't let on to us at all that she um, has anything going on, questioning where she is or anything like that. Um, we do know that at school and we happen to know at camp that she goes by a different name. Um, she goes by a male name. Um, mm -hmm. Well, not even a, yeah, a male name. Uh, more of a unisex name. Yeah, yeah, not her birth name. And so I think that what, don't, I don't want to speak for you, but what I think yeah. we want her to know and maybe her parents to know that if they want to talk to us about it in our home, that it's, that it's okay, but we don't really know how to bring that up with that because they haven't told us. We haven't been brought into that conversation. They kind of around the same lines of, you know, asking your friend, are you gay? It's like, yeah. am I supposed to do that? Or, you know, it, it seems like a, an offensive question. I don't know if that, I don't know if it is or not, but it, it's like well, asking I somebody. I asked that on some, um, early on on some dates, I would have, you know, been, been set straight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Barbara, do you have some insight on that? Uh, I have a grandson that's transgender, came out when he was uh, about 13, and I totally am, I think I'm, I admire him for being able to say who he is and to live his life the way he wants to live it. Uh, his mother's accepting, his father's not, is very hard on him. He said he had to drop out of school. Uh, he was, you know, tormented and teased, dropped out of school. I had some other issues I don't want to discuss. Uh, but now he seems to be fine because he's uh, adjusting more and seems to be happy, has a job and is doing better. But it's a very hard thing to do. It, it uh, of course, you know, I know that you, you don't say that, but I just, I admire him. I think it's wonderful that he went ahead and told people what he was and how he wanted to be and how he wanted to live his life. And it's his business. I, I really don't understand how somebody else decides what somebody else's life should be, but that's the way I guess it is somewhere. So oh. I, I, I just think accepting somebody for who they are is the best way to do. I don't see any sense in hiding it. I mean, I'm proud of my grandson. I tell people about him all the time. 
I'm not ashamed of it. So what, what I would think in our situation, do I think the best way for me to bring it up is to talk to my sister and just say, hey, is there anything that Ellie, you know, do I just say, is there anything that Ellie, we're comfortable with Ellie and anything that she's going through. Is there anything that we need to, we Could want you, you to know that we're Ellie? welcome. Instead What's that? Instead of Ellie's parents? Her parents are, I think her parents are perfectly accepting yeah. of it. Ellie's parents is my sister and my brother-in-law. And I oh, think yeah. they're very comfortable with it. I think my, my parents, Ellie's grandparents are, a little more conservative so I don't I think that's why they choose to not bring it up around our family gatherings and things sometimes they'll refer to her as E and not not Ellie or and we don't refer to her as he because we haven't been told to yeah and so we don't we don't want to and we don't want to overstep our bounds but I think they do I think that they probably know that that we are. I think from our Facebook post and our our personal family, I think they know that we're yeah very uh, comfortable with whatever choices our family makes. <laughs> well, it never hurts to to reaffirm it. Yeah, I mean, because we assume, and then, like I said, if you're around the around the young girl, um, mention some stuff. That you do, you do it with with uh, Lucy and whatnot, and her yeah. her wife. Just kind of reaffirm, and and this is really minor, but mm -hmm. some of you knew my mom, and her actual name, which I think is a fine name, but she disliked it so much that she changed it when she turned twenty one and dropped it. Her real name is Doris, and she dropped it. And she legally changed it the day she turned 21 and changed it to Gaden. So maybe the young girl just doesn't like her name. Well, and that's, a, that's a, a very valid point that we know through the grapevine where Ellie is, but we haven't been, and it just feels like we're encroaching on something that's very personal to her, that we haven't been let in on the story. And for us to make the assumptions, it feels a little hurtful or maybe a little bit overstepping. Yeah, she's got to be at a place where she's comfortable enough with herself to talk to somebody else. So I think yeah. just creating the space as best you can in what you talk about and what you say. How old is she? Did you say 14? She's yeah. a freshman, yeah. I mean, she's old enough to where if Kevin felt comfortable talking to his sister and saying, hey, do you think we could have this conversation. Maybe she's comfortable enough to where she would rather have the conversation with you guys than with her parents. Mm -hmm. okay. In my situation, it, it's so similar. <laughs> like it's uncanny, <laughs> but uh, the family would not be accepting whatsoever. And I feel like that would keep them from letting family know and uh, is probably causing a lot of internal struggle. And um, I don't, I don't know how to, like, I feel like maybe I need to just directly say, Hey, if you ever need to talk about anything, I'm a safe person to talk to. Um, I don't agree with your parents and grandparents on a lot of things, but you know, I would, I would be safe to talk to no matter what. And like, that's the only thing I can think to, to do. Cause I don't know that I feel like, I don't know that I feel safe uh, being really open about it with the family. Um, I don't know, just because I'm weak, like, <laughs> I don't want to be attacked, but I, I should be stronger, and that's awful, because I want my children, that kind of leads into a later question, I want my children to be strong enough to stand up for, for others and say, hey, this is wrong, 
to 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 believe this way and and to um, discriminate and make kids feel like an abomination like that's so wrong and i'm i'm very introverted and i don't usually speak up and that's i think that's my the thing i hate about myself the most is i i never speak up when i should so um i want my children to be able to speak up and i i want to be more brave <laughs> and speak up even when it's family you know one little thing i'm hearing um is probably one of the best things you can do is even if you want to go so far as to say forgiving your your siblings who are the parents of these children you know just forgiving them for not looping you in or not sharing this news with you um that you know just don't add to family conflict it's so easy to do that and to feel resentment and all but that sure isn't going to help anybody so if you can i would think that would that would help Okay, uh, let's, let's move to another question. Um, how can we best explain homophobia or transphobia to our children in age appropriate ways? And, and this came up in the book a little bit um, where she mentioned um, the pulse shootings and um, she had you know, taught her children about loving others, but she then had to tell them that, you know, there are people out there who have hate in their heart and are willing to kill these people just for who they are. So, um, like my children are eight, almost nine, and I don't know, like I have never told them about things like that happening. Um, I've only said, you know, kids can get bullied in school for being different and things like that. But I don't know, when do I start letting them know what, you know, what can go on in the world that, that is a lot more horrific. So again, this straight person, but eight and nine year old is kind of my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, and now is like the perfect time, I would say. I would say between third and fourth grade is sort of the, the perfect time to start introducing those sort of hard realities because um, just developmentally, that's a huge flip um, in brain development and they're first starting to, to really sort of empathize on a deep level and sort of understand beyond the pragmatic and into sort of this representative uh, reality, um, I guess. And so I, I really wouldn't get too deep before um, eight or nine, but, but now is kind of the time I would think, and Stephanie may have opinions too, <laughs> to start sort of introducing um, introducing some of those books are a great way if you can find any books about it yeah and that's why i volunteered to you know come tonight because <clears throat> there are so many books and i can uh share some of those um let's see uh i found i, I talked to my daughter emily and she gave just gave me this wonderful list that came from the san francisco library during pride month and um Chad has that link, or I can send it to you, Jenna. <clears throat> and so that's one we can get out. But um, the way I would use books would be just, you know, their books from early, early age have had uh, mean things happen. And I'm sure that your kids have asked questions about that. And why well, was so and so mean to, you know, they want to know about human interactions. And I would just make it all a part of that um, intolerance of race. And I know that they've 
uh, studied at school, you know, on Martin Luther King Day, if nothing else, uh, about people have been mean to African Americans. And, you know, it's just all part of that continuum. So, as Becky said, and I don't, I don't know, Becky, do they, I don't know if you need to drag back history about, look what happened at the Pulse nightclub. Well, so I, I think the whole concept of like people not liking people, I mean, specifically for, for who they love sometimes, and not just saying people don't like people because they're different, because that kind of vagueness can actually be kind of hurtful. So, so being specific, I think is really important. And even that can happen at like, you know, six. Yeah. Um, but the, or, but the sort of specific, dragging back history, no, uh, the, the Pulse nightclub, not necessarily, but, but mentioning that people have been killed, yeah, or, or sort of talking about like Matthew Shepard, but maybe not like too specific, but like that, he, that he was killed, um, and I, I think that, is around eight or nine is when I would start getting into specifics like that. But, but sort of the generalities of like, of not liking people because they like, because they marry people of the same sex or, or because that they um, feel like a different sex than they are. Like those sorts of things can happen even earlier than that. Um, what, I mean, I, I, I'm, that's just sort of my experience with the kids. Obviously, I don't talk about a lot of that stuff with my class because I teach third grade and I'm not like a parent of a third grader, but just sort of my experience with what they can handle and process. But Stephanie, I kind of refer, I'm not an expert. <laughs> well, you've got a lot of experience with that age though. Thanks. Thank y'all. Um, so let's see, how can we prepare our children to stand firm against homophobia and transphobia among their peers, which, like I said, it was very common when I was growing up and um, I may have been a part of it just with the offhand comments, oh, that's okay, because like everybody said it. So how, I, I feel awful like expecting this of my kids when I wasn't that way and I'm still not that way, not brave enough to, to speak up when I should. Um, how do we give them those skills? I think, again, we're certainly no experts, but um, my children's first wedding was not a, was not was a same sex couple getting married. And so that was their only, that was her only understanding of a, of a wedding um, for, you know, that's what she knew. And she has only ever known in our family that sometimes girls get married to girls, um, but they, and sometimes girls get married to boys. But even as a four and five year old on the playground, she's already had conversations with her friends that say that she can't marry, she can't, she can't marry a girl if she wants to. And so she comes home with that and it's like, well, in our family, we believe that you can marry, except for your sister, <laughs> whomever you want, because she really does want to marry your sister. Um, but other than that, you know, and so it, that, that's been kind of hard because I don't know that she completely believes us, um, to be honest. But when all of her little friends know nothing else, you know, thankfully we had a teacher that year that um, has been in some of those situations herself. So she, she was able to sort of intervene in that conversation. But um, again, four and five year olds is, are already questioning it. And so we just do our best of saying, you know, you can marry whomever you love and whether it's a girl or a boy, that's, you know, that's going to be up to you when the time comes, but we just want them to love you and you to love them. But it's, I mean, I don't think this is going to be the last time we have that conversation. Probably not. You know, too, you can say, well, that is the way it used to be, as a matter of fact, you know, yeah. but it's not that way. We've learned more and it's not that way. We realize that that was wrong. Yeah. Um, because we're all going to, you know, I don't know, uh, some of this is going to come from churches too. And 
Yeah. I think that's something, um, even in our church, you know, um, that was, that was the way people, some people thought, and, you know, so um, that's a way to touch on it again, historically. I also think there's a lot of power in somebody that isn't the parent saying it to them too. Our five-year-old neighbor, who's a little girl, um, told Simon that he could not paint his toenails, but he, which he really loves to do, um, and that he could not wear like his pink sparkly unicorns, which he also really loves to do. And um, Sadie told him he could not do that because he was a boy. And Sadie and Miss Becky had to come to Jesus that yes, he must absolutely can. Um, and I have no problem having that conversation with the neighbor kid, but Simon was still very incredulous. Um, but I got like my mom to talk with him about it and he didn't really believe me, but he believed my mom. So having someone that isn't the parent say it could, cause he's still rocking the toenail polish and the pink sparkly unicorns and Sadie knows to keep her mouth shut. Um, so did any of you, uh, did any of you, when you were children, have a friend speak up for you um, or defend you or, you know, tell somebody that's not okay? Well, I was in the closet until I was 24, so um, none of my friends knew. I don't think I knew that about myself back then. I was so scared of that truth, but I did get called a girl and a sissy a lot because I wasn't really athletic. Um, and I was petrified by that because I knew there was some truth to that. But no, I, I never had anybody stand up for me um, in any way. No. I. I came out after the, well, in the Navy, so, no. That's hard to hear. Um, let's see. Where, where, did, where did you feel safe and seen when you were growing up? Um, I mean, was there any place that felt safe? Well, I grew up at Idlewild and I mean, I knew I was gay when I was 14. Um, and the last thing you wanted to be was gay in Memphis, Tennessee in the 1980s. Um, and so I didn't tell anyone and I did my best to, to hide it and had dates with different girls and, um, I went on a date with my, my prom date was an Idlewild uh, member, um, Diane Snow, Diane Reed Snow. We were um, prom dates and, um, and we went out a few times also in high school and um, I, Idlewild never really I never really heard, I never heard anything anti-gay preached from the pulpit. Um, if anything, or, or even raised in the youth room um, as, a, as a topic. Uh, Idlewild, in my opinion, was, um, was silent on the issue when I, was, when I was growing up. It was never... To me, it, my recollection, it was never discussed, which is good in some ways, but also bad because then it's just like, oh my God, we can't even talk about it. Um, and so I will say this, and Stephanie, you might could help me. I think his name was Dr. Curry. Curry, do you remember Curry? He would go to family camp and- Curry Hearn. Perry Hearn, I, I, I'm pretty sure he was gay. He was an older man, a therapist, older. He was probably my age. <laughs> I think 50 older. something. Um, but he was, um, he was very much a, a 
a, a vital member of the church and there every Sunday and went to family camp in Nakomi, but he would always come up, he would always come up to people and, and massage you wherever you were. You would just get massaged and you're sitting at the breakfast at Nakomi, he'd come up and massage you, women, men. Anyhow, the point of the story is, I, I think he was gay. Um, I have no real proof on that, but my point is he, I knew he was accepted. He was part of the church. Um, and I've just sort of gone down a rabbit hole telling you about Dr. Curry, uh, Masashi people. <laughs> that he was he's famous just, for that. Um, the one, one time I remember, you know, before Idlewild did come into um, talking about it, et cetera, um, I think as in many churches that think that it's not right to be gay, uh, sometimes the music directors are. I mean, that's just kind of a, uh, maybe a stereotype, but I think it does exist. And people just kind of put on blinders, but um, our choir director, Peter Pisarno, um was gay and lived with a, a man, and of course it was before you could be married. They weren't married, but um, I distinctly remember Henry Strzok, it was, I guess, when the issue was coming up in um, about ordination in the Presbyterian Church, ordaining gays. And he did say something from the pulpit against that. And I just remember where I sat was looking just over Henry's shoulder at Peter Paserno. And I just thought, what is wrong with this picture? How can you say that when there is Peter, your employee, you know, your colleague on the staff. But um, so, yeah, it was pretty silent until then it officially was uh, negative about ordination. But there was always the message of love, I think, with that. It was just a technicality of ordination. And then, luckily, Chad and Martin and AJ and came along and, and a lot of other people and got us on the right track. We wouldn't have come along if it hadn't been for Mark Jones staying in there though. But like Mark said, this, the places I felt safe before were places where it was not talked about. If it wasn't overtly negative and overt hate, then that was the only safe space I had. And that was my church in rural North Mississippi, a Presbyterian church. It wasn't preached. It wasn't talked against, but it wasn't talked about at all. But that was a much safer option for me than the big Baptist church down the road that my friends went to that were always spouting homophobic rants. Um, and so why I came to Idlewild was because I didn't want to be a place where it just wasn't talked about and it was kind of okay under the rug. I wanted to be at a place where it was okay and it was out there in front. And there were people like Mark Jones that had been here and they had hosted Covenant Network that they'd been on the front line. They'd, they'd really been putting the word out there that this was okay. It just wasn't an off topic, something we didn't talk about anymore. Um, and so to have a space, safe place now, you don't have to find one that's just not negative and by default that becomes your safe space there are overtly safe places now um, that hopefully more LGBTQ youth will be able to get there or at least be connected to. Did you feel safe with your parents uh, knowing that about you? No. I didn't come out to my parents until I was like 29. Those were probably the last people I wanted to tell. Um, I, I don't know who I shared this with, but I shared it just earlier that with my own parents, my mother in particular, um, oh, I shared it with Sarah, sorry, Christian. Um, it's when Oprah Winfrey was making her big debut and uh, she had her talk show, I don't know, in the 80s, early 80s, 
early 80s, yeah. And uh, one of our first episodes was uh, was a panel of gay men with AIDS. And I was watching it. My mother came in, saw it. And she said, what are you watching? I said, these men and the, on Oprah. And she said, oh, well, they all have AIDS. They're going to die. They get what they deserve. And that um, sadly has stuck with me my entire, still. Um, have we moved past it? Yeah. But, uh, you know, you don't really remember the words, but you remember how it made you feel. So if that's anything that any of you parents can take away from this, um, watch your words. Words matter. Um, and your kids will remember what you say uh, when you are blue and gray. And uh, they will remember more um, how they felt. I can tell you honestly, I wanted to die right then and there when she said that. It was horrible. Yeah, I think the reason I was so scared to my parents is I never heard them say overtly negative things about gays and lesbians, but they never said anything positive. They were always the quiet, we don't talk about that. And so, of course, I wasn't going to be comfortable in that space. Um, I felt safe there, but not safe being out. And so I think, that, like they've said, words matter. Um, the ad you know, the adjectives you use matter and overtly saying and talking about homosexuality matters. Even if it's not a direct, we're going to sit down and having a birds and the bees conversation. It needs to be in the everyday vocabulary and talked about and not just avoided because it's uncomfortable or you don't know what to say. Just say something. That's where I think I'll put another plug in for books. That's where I think books can come in um, because it's not like Chad said, it's not a, okay, we're going to sit down and talk about something serious here. It, you read books about all kinds of things and you, you talk about them. And I know that you probably um, want your children's libraries to have, have representation of different um, races and nationalities and so if just having some of these wonderful books and there really are some wonderful ones now that just um, represent different kinds of families and uh, and now they really there's some good books about gender let's see Emily mentioned one to me that she said it, it's not charming or you know and uh, but it, it was just sort of so straightforward. Um, let's see which one it was. Um, I think it was, it feels good to be yourself. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, one page has uh, Maria's uh, a girl and feels like a girl and the next one you know it's almost like going through all the different identities so uh, it wasn't a very appealing book to her child but it was just like okay you know you know let's read something with a story to it but uh, just having that around seems to me that that would help kind of like what I was saying earlier it's better to like make a straight person feel awkward or weird or bored than it is to risk leaving out the kid who needs it. Thanks, Chad, for putting that uh, yeah. link there. There's the link in the chat that Stephanie sent me. I hope it works. And I will also email it to you, Jen. Thank you. Um, where has Idlewild's engagement with our LGBTQ plus community been helpful? And how can we improve? What can we do better? Well, I'll, I'll, 
I'll say one thing, and Chad mentioned this earlier, is is the pride flags that are hanging up in the um, um, Sunday school room, hanging up on the in, in the junior high, senior high wing, the youth wing. Having something that simple um, up is incredible. I mean, Idlewild actually has done a lot of great stuff in the last 15 years, um, but that's that's simple and they see it every week and it's it's just part of the room decor um so i that's i applaud that great not to mention that they have uh aj and chad as sunday school teachers or youth advisors and they have laura um as a confirmation mentor you know absolutely they know they've got a safe person they can go to our our kids do uh, that's a big change yeah Adawalt has done amazing things um the the thing i would like to see us do more of is probably more engagement with the congregation like meetings like this right here having this discussion um and, and it not just being the lgbtq and ally group off doing this thing but if you're free bring your kids to pride i know that's not possible this year but you know these events that that Ottawa participates in and that we help sponsor and are not just for members of the lgbtq family we would love to have members of the congregation come and join us and that could be one way you know to show up and it just be a normal thing a discussion with your kids but i think getting the congregation more involved in some of these outreach activities would be a big yeah and let me just say in case you don't those of you don't know i wild i think for the last 10 years nine or ten years has marched in the annual lgbtq parade with an Idlewild banner. Um, I mean, it's clearly Idlewild and, 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 and has had a, a, a tent, a booth at the um, Pride Festival, uh, again, with Idlewild banners and all that, and sometimes handing out little cups. Isn't that what we've done, Chad? Little cups or something. Um, and then we've also sponsored a, a movie at Outflix, uh, which is the LGBTQ annual um, film festival in town. And so our logo is up every, um, before every screening, really. They run a logo, a logo loop. Um, and so we are, we're seen out there, that's for sure. Not this year, but other years. Yeah, from, from my friends in the community that are not church people, are not familiar with Idlewild, they all know that Idlewild is open and accepting and affirming. They, um, that's just something that, that the Gay Straight Fellowship has helped promote and just to put our name out there. And it's well known, I think, in the LGBTQ community in Memphis that Idlewild is a safe space. That's really good to hear. Well, and if you hadn't been by the church, we've got a big banner out front now. That's, I forget what it says, but it celebrates, it's got some rainbow colors on it and celebrates Pride Month. September is sort of Pride Month in Memphis because June is so daggum hot. Do we have any parents of LGBTQ kids with us? I don't know. Oh, well, <laughs> of older, <laughs> of older kids, <laughs> I guess should be the, of out kids. That, good for you, Becky, because that's exactly the kind of different, you know, just use of language that, that we ought to be aware of. And that's part of why I wanted to have this class because, I mean, us, those of us with young children, none of us know, and it's entirely a possibility. And 
we want to make sure that our kids know that we're safe. I will say though safe. that so sexuality doesn't usually develop until like puberty ish, but um, gender identity mm -hmm. develops at like three, so or even earlier sometimes. So I will say I, I do seem to have some like they they define themselves as male, but. So I guess um, sometimes Simon is a dinosaur, but usually <laughs> he's male. Uh, the question would have been um, for the parents of older LGBTQ kids. Uh, looking back, what what would you say you did well, or wish you would have done differently? So I guess the question could be, what do you wish you had? What do you wish your parents had said or done? to make your home a safe place when you were a child? Where, what would have made you feel safe to come out to your parents? You know, that's a hard question to answer because the world was such a bad place. Christian Brothers High School was, that's the last thing you wanted to be, was, was openly gay at Christian, or even suspected, or even teased. Um, I mean, my parents loved me. I told them they accepted that day. It was not a, I mean, it, it was a, wow, we've got a gay son. What does this mean? But it was made clear that day that they loved me and that wasn't going to change. I, I, but I don't know what they, I mean, it just would, it would have been different if I had come out in high school. They would have wanted me to see a therapist. And I'm, not, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just what you did in 1984 if your child said you were gay. They were gay. I don't know. I think watching, watching your language, watch, watch your words. Um, you know, and, and, a lot of par and a lot of parents, it's like, you know, Mark and Chad and I, we all have brothers. And they, you know, when you ask our parents now, you know, did you raise them? They, they probably even questioned themselves, you know, wow, what did we do wrong? We raised you all the same. And that's the truth. We all got raised the same way, but I think that they're now, now we know better. And I think that we should um, be mindful of what we, what comes out of our mouths and how we respond to things and how we treat um, uh, people of the LGBTQ plus community. It's the same way with the, the things we say about race. You know, we're trying to become very mindful now of discussions around race and equality. And that, that's the same thing that we want to hear those discussions with LGBTQ. Um, so watching what you say about race and watching what you say about homosexuality um, and just, just creating that safe environment um, on an everyday basis. You know, this, this is just, this idea just hit me, but if you, I don't know if you, our DVD player isn't hooked up, but um, if you could buy some DVDs of gay, classic gay films and just, I might say you gotta watch them, but if you just put them into the stack of, of DVDs, um, just so your kids are kind of looking through them, it, wow, you've got some, we got some gay films in here. Um, or if there's some classic gay books uh, or gay authors, stick them on the shelf with, in the library with the other, uh, with the other books. Um, again, you don't have to read them, but just that, wow, you've got these with everything else. Of course, you, yeah, never mind. <laughs> That's a good idea, thank you. And I think a lot of this um, talking and thinking, of course, it's, it's wonderful that you're doing this. And I think as much as anything, uh, you're preparing yourself 
too. Um, there have been a couple of coming out stories that I've heard in fairly recently, and I was absolutely shocked that the parents were had a negative reaction. They were not people who I would have expected that from um, because they have gay friends and, you know, um, but when it's your own child, um, so like, like Becky's attitude, you know, just always know that it's a possibility and, and be ready for it so you don't get caught off guard like that. I have a quick question before you go. It's kind of, I don't know if it's off top. It's probably off topic, but I still want to ask it anyways because it's relevant to me in this moment. Um, so I have an interview. I'm being, well, I'm being interviewed by a college kid, like a teacher program. And her email says, Samantha, and just being nosy, she signed it Sam. And just being nosy, I like Facebooked her because I just want to see like what she looks like. I really want to ask Sam what their pronoun is um, because I don't want to like offend. Is it okay to just like ask someone like, Hey, what's your pronoun? Like, is that, or is that offensive? Most people phrase it as what pronoun do you prefer? I'd bring up bewitched. The, the show bewitched with Samantha, Sam. No, oh, never mind. You froze for the answer. I couldn't hear. Everybody froze except for oh. me. Oh, I, I bring up bewitched. Bring up bewitched. Okay. The Sam, Samantha. I uh, never mind. Bring oh no, I got it. But, okay. but I. But okay. she does not Goodbye. look like. Goodbye. She she looks more like Darren than Sam. Okay. Ask her which pronouns she prefers. That's becoming common, kind of commonplace now at different conferences. And I even see it sometimes on the youth Zoom on Sunday night because of some of their schools that our youth are in, they'll have their pronouns by their name on Zoom, which I think is amazing. But just at, say, hey, what pronoun do you prefer? And that's not gonna be offensive. Probably not. Okay, thank you. I don't know if that was off topic, but it was relevant. That's perfect topic. Does anyone have any other quick questions before we shut it down? I was gonna say, and Stephanie kind of hit the nail on the head with, don't be surprised when my sister came out to my mother and I, um, we were very surprised. We weren't, but we were. Um, and when she told us, the first reaction my mother said was, are you sure? Don't say that. <laughs> because <laughs> she knew, I mean, she wouldn't have said that if she wasn't sure. Um, and I, we also, um, just my family in the way our sense of humor is, I mean, we were, we were very nonchalant about it and we were like, okay. You know, she and she had to tell us because we were going to a wedding together where she was going to introduce Sarah for the first time, um, her now wife. Um, and the only reaction that I could have that I had was, isn't she a little young for you? <laughs> that wasn't very kind either. <laughs> so <laughs> preparing yourself now is good. Also, Sarah's like two years younger than her. She's younger. She looks young. Anyhow, does anybody else put their pronouns on their signature? No. I'm understanding that that um, from Lucy Catherine, that that is actually very common in, in her world that she, that, that everyone puts their pronouns on their signature. But I don't. I you see it a lot. I see it a lot. Name? I haven't done it, but I do that. You know, that's words too. You know, if, if you, someone gets an um, email, a message or whatever from you, or it's on your name tag, or um, you, you're sending a safe space message. Yeah. 
-hmm. It's yeah. usually, you know, like your signature where it would say, you know, Whitney Gemmon, First Presbyterian, blah, 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 blah she slash her. Um, but I mean, I've seen it, but it's not something that I use. Yeah, it, it'll be comfort to y'all knowing that like at Montreat, at these youth conferences and camps and everything, they do include pronouns on everything. All the kids have their own pronouns and it's amazing what you see. It's, it's fantastic. I, I, I loved it. I loved what I saw. Good stuff. I'm going to try to rebound from my bewitch comment and just say that people who, um, um, if we, when we get back to church, if folks want to, they could start putting their pronouns on their name tag. Just as an option. I think they could definitely put them on the like engraved deacon name tags. I think that seeing the pronouns listed on an email signature or a name tag are the signs of a safe person, like the signs back when I was growing up, or maybe the wording partner. I think that pronouns now are the, are the flag to the LGBTQ community that that's a safe person. That's a good point. Um, anyone else have anything else to add? All right. Oh, well. It's awful. Can you hear me? Yes. I just want to thank Mark and AJ and Chad and Jenna. Um, this has been really great. And I would love to see if we could do something similar uh, in the spring um, when we have our full class again. Because uh, I think this information needs to be heard um, by as many as, as can be present. Because I know we're, we're pretty small tonight. But I think a lot of good things were said and a lot of good questions were asked tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. And I definitely agree. I think we need to do this again once we're able to come back to church in person. <laughs> For sure. Yes. It's, I, I, I just like love having these conversations. I would just like to say I certainly miss everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> well, thank y'all all for coming tonight. Well, thank you. Can I all right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thank y'all.